So hi everybody, I'm Jacob Olsufka. I work at Spotify, the popular music streaming company as a visual analytics engineer. And since the title of my talk is Making Data Dance with Analytics, I'm gonna start by telling you a, sh a story that shows how we've done just that at Spotify, bringing data to life. The story begins on August 21st, 2017. A couple of years ago, there was a total solar eclipse, an event so rare that people paid thousands of dollars to stay in Motel 6s and in strangers' homes, middle of nowhere around the country, just so they could get a glimpse of this event. And as we learned at Spotify, the only thing that people love more than traveling to see it is listening to Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart while doing so. My, Sky, uh, my coworker Skyler, sitting up here in the front, built this really fun viz that tracks uh, the peak streams of that song across the US. You can see it start up in the West Coast in the morning and perfectly travel across the country in a diagonal following that path of totality where the moon was completely blocking out the sun. So this is an example of how we make data dance for public. For the rest of the talk, I want to take you backstage and show you how, how we make data dance internally. Like I said, I'm a visual analytics engineer. I am an active member of the Tableau community, currently serving as a Tableau public ambassador, and I help lead the Tableau user group out in New York. A couple of my Tableau public creations have been shortlisted for the Information is Beautiful Awards. And a couple of years back, I was up on stage in Iron Viz, like many of you probably went to last night. So this talk, we're going to have a lot of GIFs. We'll see if at the end of it, you can tell what my favorite television show is. We're going to talk a lot about how we've built our insights and analytics community at Spotify and how we're taking advantage of Tableau within that. The second half of the talk is the extra spicy portion. We're going to be talking about how to enable Tableau superstars. And I'm going to leave you all with some of my favorite dashboarding tips. So we're going to be talking about several different questions throughout this talk, starting with how to ensure that the path to data is short for everyone at a company that wants quick and easy access to their data and dashboards. One of the key components of that is enabling uh, an analysis-friendly ecosystem. We're going to look at how to keep everyone in enabled and on the same page, empowered across our entire company to be creating great dashboards. And then once everyone has been creating these dashboards, how we surface them to all of our users. And then last, I'll leave you with some of my favorite dashboarding tips. So we're going to start with that first question of how do we ensure that the path to data is short? Taking an example of a small scale company with a centralized BI and analytics team, in this representation, each dot is an employee. The green dots represent employees involved in analytics. And the larger the circle, it might represent a team lead or the CEO there in the middle. So the nature of an organization like this ensures that the path to data is short and everyone has quick access to data, dashboards, and insights. These people probably sit right across the desk from you, and so if you have a question or a new request, it's easy to track them down. The challenge becomes how do we scale this culture as a company like this grows in size? So now we see that company growing. We see the clusters are starting to represent different teams. Again, each dot still representing employees. One approach might be to just scale that centralized analytics team along with the company as it grows. That cluster in the top right in green, that's your growing centralized analytics team. But let's take a look at what actually might happen if someone at this company has an analytics question. We're going to take an example of Tim. He's a team lead. He loves using data to drive decisions. He has a question about an interesting trend that he saw in a dashboard. And he wants to know if he can trust it. So first, he goes to his teammate to see if they can help. 
And in classic Michael fashion, he has no idea. He can't help him out. So next he goes to his other teammate, Kelly, and she also doesn't know how to help him. He's worked with a neighboring team in the past led by Karen, but she also can't answer his question. You can see now he's already gone through three different people at the company and still has no answer. So Tim has to go all the way across to this centralized analytics team to try to figure out what's going on with his data. Imagine this scaling across the whole company every day, new requests coming in. In a setup like this, the path to data and insights is long. And when you have a request or a question, it might not be as personalized to you as you want. We have probably all dealt with ANSI stakeholders when they're waiting for data. We know that nobody ever wants to be caught waiting for data. So let's take a look at how we can solve some of these challenges that I just talked about. Again, we're trying to answer this question of how do we make the path to data and insights shorter? And as a company grows, can we scale that culture along with it? So at Spotify, we've approached this problem and the challenge of keeping everyone close to data by distributing our insights team throughout the company, both physically and practically making everyone closer to data. So we have data scientists, user researchers, behavioral scientists, analytics engineers, all spread out on different teams working on squads that impact product development. In this type of setup, it's much easier for everyone to remain close and connected to the data that they need to perform their jobs. If Tim had been in this setup, he would have probably gotten his answer way quicker because his teammates would be the ones that are directly involved with the data and dashboards. And now we have happy stakeholders. In order to keep these stakeholders happy and the path for data to remain short, we need to be sure that we're designing for an analysis friendly ecosystem. So at a company like Spotify, where we have data coming in from all different directions, this requires some attention. A typical product team at Spotify might look something like this, where we have a product area lead, back-end and front-end engineers all working alongside our data folks, so the data scientists, the data engineers, and then this mystery role that I'll talk about, and then the product designers that are designing this beautiful streaming service that you all know and love. I want to focus in on some of those key contributors to the data ecosystem, namely the data scientists, the data engineers, and this mystery role. So data engineers, they love focusing on data for systems, moving and organizing large amounts of data from one location to another as fast as possible. They're building instrumentation so that we can keep accurate and detailed logs of what's happening with our users. They don't always like, however, building pipelines for analysis or thinking about those data science needs downstream and the analysis that's gonna end up happening with that data. On the other side of the spectrum, we have data scientists who love designing experiments, building models, using those experiments and models to come up with really impactful and interesting analysis and insights. And of course, we're here at the Tableau conference so that we know that a great way to communicate insights is through visualizing data. However, to get to that, they don't wanna have to chase down 10 different tables across a company, dealing with messy joins, maintaining those data sets, writing pipelines, or dealing with building dashboards and having to worry about why something is broken and fixing that. So between these two different roles, there's clearly a gap that we can see that's not fully allowing us to fulfill that goal of having an analysis-friendly ecosystem. So enter analytics engineers like myself to save the day. We love building pipelines for people rather than system, thinking about that end user. This means we're encoding business logic within our data sets so it can persist throughout the company, 
adding in analysis friendly columns if we need. All of this work should be leading to a true self-service platform where technical and non-technical users alike can fulfill their data needs. Myself as a visual analytics engineer, I'm focused on putting together high quality dashboards for the whole company. So to place where we have data engineers, analytics engineers, data scientists, all working in harmony together. Now everyone is happy. More importantly though, we're optimizing for the value that all of these people can add to our insights community. You may have just been looking at these slides and thought to yourself, well, I do all three of those things. Everything he just talked about, I do myself. At a small company, all of these different roles might be taken on by one person, and that's great. But as you scale in size, we found this to be a really successful way to set up and optimize the system. So the ultimate goal of analytics engineers, bridging that gap between data science and data engineering, creating this true self-service culture, making sure that everyone has the tools that they need. We're trying to make appro data approachable for everyone. Even non-technical users shouldn't be intimidated by using data. As a visual analytics engineer, the way that I'm getting data to people is through dashboards. And so the tool that I'm talking about is Tableau. So let's take a look at how Spotify makes the most of Tableau. At a high level, again, we're trying to use this to make data approachable for everyone. We're automating asks. We don't want our data scientists to be constantly being asked to pull new numbers for them. We want everyone to feel empowered to go find those numbers and answers themselves. Ultimately, if we're doing this successfully, we're going to be able to positively impact this service by uncovering insights about our users and creators. The next question I'll talk about, so we've solved the problem of keeping everyone close to data, but in a sense, by distributing our team, we've created a new problem. And so with no centralized team, how are we ensuring that everyone across the company is on the same page and building great dashboards? We've invested a lot of time into creating resources for everyone. Design guides, color palettes specifically designed for data visualization, icon sets to be used in our dashboards across the company. We have teams that have dashboarding templates so that users are familiar with that dashboarding style. They know where to go to find their most important information. They know how to filter and they know how to interact with the dashboard. All of this is going to build trust with our users. And my favorite way that we empower everyone across the company is by keeping things spicy. So this isn't just a joke. It's actually become a way of life at Spotify. When I'm talking about spicy dashboards or spicy insights, I really mean high quality. So this attachment of a fun theme of spiciness, it gets people talking about high quality design in a more approachable and fun way. And we love to have fun at Spotify. So we have everyone across the company that's inspired to go build the spiciest dashboards or look for the spiciest insight to share with their team. I have these spicy insights stickers up here. Come find me after if you want one. So along these lines, we've built spicy presentations. This is a great deck all about designing the best dashboards. We have spicy checklists which is a set of best practices and standards that we want all of our dashboard authors across the whole company using. This goes into the different components of dashboarding from requirements gathering, design, usability, and data preparation. So with all of these resources together, we can set up everyone at the company for success. Now that everyone is creating these great dashboards, the next question is how can we make sure that it's easy to find these relevant and trusted dashboards? None of this great work is going to matter if our dashboards aren't highly visible 
easy to find. We have our data that has created this great analysis and we want that to actually drive decisions. So Tableau serves as that link between analysis and decision making. When someone has a question, we want them to know exactly where to go. Those dashboards need to be up to date, well maintained, and up to our highest standards of quality. So we've solved this with something that we call insights portals. These are designed to be the go-to hub for all of our dashboards. It also enables us to have multiple formats of reports. So we have a mix of dashboards, research projects, blog posts, all in one place in a simple interface that depending on where you are, what section of the business you're in, you have all of your important dashboards in one place. So now that you know a little bit more about how we do things at Spotify, I'm going to move on to the next uh, section of my talk. I'm sure now you all want to know how you can make your own dashboards even spicier. So I want to share some of my favorite tips with you. There's actually 10 of them, but you're going to have to come work for Spotify to hear the other six. All right, tip number one is understanding visual hierarchy. What is visual hierarchy? I'm going to let you read the slide and then you should start to get it. This is encompassing every choice that we make when we're influencing what we want a user to notice on a dashboard. It enables us to create reports that are both visually appealing and attracting the right attention to the right places. I'm not going to have time to cover all these principles, but they encompass size and scale, color and contrast, typography, repetition, spacing, among others. If we look at eye tracking studies, we can really see how this comes to light. On the left here, we have a web page, and we see that the eye starts in the top left, and by the time you're down in the bottom right, nobody's even looking there. As a dashboard designer, I know that I need to prioritize my most important information in the spots where your eye is going to be looking, so I'm going to put that information up in the top and in the left. We can think about flow through our dashboards as we move from section to section. So here's a really nice pattern of looking across and down and across and down. Google search is a great example of visual hierarchy being utilized. When you type in something and you're looking at your results, you have those headers that you can easily scan down. Once you find something you're interested in, you can then look towards the subtext to learn more. Okay, so this is one of my favorite examples. The importance of visual hierarchy and the consequences of when it's done poorly. If you remember a couple of years ago at the Oscars, for best picture they announced La La Land at first when in fact they had not won. The reason why this happened was because the presenters were handed the wrong card. They were handed a card for best actress. All of this was because of bad visual hierarchy. So this is an example of what that card looked like to the presenter. Why is this bad? Let's start at the top. Everyone knows it's the Oscars. That's not important information. What is important, however, is that we're announcing the right award, right? Tiny here at the bottom, it says Best Actress. That's really easy to mix. Emma Stone and La La Land are the same exact size, weight, typography, so neither of them is emphasized. I don't know what the focal point is. I know I'm announcing Best Picture and I see a movie on there, so I just said that name. All of this could have been solved with some really simple reorganization and resizing of the text. So now with strong visual hierarchy, at the top I have Best Actress. I could know right away I have the wrong card. Emma Stone is emphasized. My eye is drawn to that. There's no mistaking what this card is about. And this is a very simple change, right? It's just going in and making your font a little bit bigger. But this is a very important thing to think about. So we have these KPI tiles all over our dashboards. We can utilize visual hierarchy to draw the attention to them. Taking an example of a metric at Spotify, 4.87 million streams. If I'm building a dashboard, I want users looking at that number. So to draw the attention to that number, I can use color and contrast. I can use weighting, making it bolder. I can make it bigger. I can place it on top so your eye starts there. 
or I can use fill to emphasize that number. When we bring all of these together, now we have a really nicely designed KPI tile that is easy for our users to notice. Tip number two, applying Gestalt principles. You'll note that these first two tips are more theoretical, data viz fundamentals. I think this is crucial. A lot of this is things that we maybe have heard or know exist. But when we're under the pressure of creating dashboards and stakeholders, these ANSI stakeholders that want dashboards now, sometimes we don't actually apply these to our dashboards. And that can be seen in poor design and usability. So I think it's important to focus on these from the start when you're thinking about building your dashboards from the ground up. Gestalt principles are all about how we naturally perceive objects as organized patterns. An important application of these principles as it pertains to dashboarding is grouping. So we can clearly let a user know what sections and parts of a dashboard are related by utilizing borders, spacing, and fill. Here's an abstracted version of a dashboard. We can see how this comes to life. The fill is letting you know that things are grouped together horizontally. The borders are letting you know that there's a vertical grouping. And then there's this spacing pattern at the bottom that lets us know that that pattern is broken. There's a new section below that something different is happening. This is a trick that I would encourage you all to think about using putting a white box on top of a gray background. Every single dashboard that I built utilizes this as a way to draw attention to the important sections and act as a spotlight. All right, my third tip is all about common metric dashboard layouts. A metric dashboard is the type of dashboard that allows you to see all of your metrics at once and from a high level then measure the health of your business. We have a lot of these at Spotify. Different teams want to know their different metrics, how they're performing. And I noticed that essentially we're doing the same thing over and over again, but just with different metrics. And so I wanted to put some templates together to make the creation of these easier. Let's start by looking at some of the common components of a metrics dashboard. Big ass numbers. These aren't called small ass numbers. They're called big ass numbers for a reason. We want them big, we want them bold. We want people looking at them so that they can at a glance monitor the business. Often accompanying these are growth metrics. So your big ass number is a snapshot of where your metric is. Your growth shows you if you're growing or declining. Trends are great ways to also have patterns and see if there's seasonality between your metrics. And oftentimes for these, we want to compare across our valuable uh, key slices of the business. So having simple bars is a really easy way to, again, at a glance, see those comparisons on the screen. I think this is super important, having transparency of the definitions of your metrics, being consistent across a company. At Spotify, we don't want one team defining streams or monthly active users one way and another team doing it another way. So an easy way to have transparency around that and encourage everyone to use the same definitions is actually to spell them out on your dashboard, make them easy for people to find. It would be confusing. I have two different definitions of metrics here. If you thought that I was talking about the Canadian rock band and not the system or standard of measurement. So here's our five components. Big ass numbers, growth, trends, bars, definitions. Let's take a look next at how these actually fit into a layout on a dashboard. So I'm going to show you the layout of my most used dashboard at Spotify. All right, so I only, I only promised you the layout. But here is a nice metrics dashboard with these metric tiles all stacked on top of another, putting all of the important metrics for our business in one place. We have the big ass numbers so we can see there where the measure is. We can see how it's growing quarter over quarter, year over year. These trends allow us to see seasonality. 
and then we're comparing with simple bars across our key markets. That metric definition is right there on the screen. If I'm a user and I want to send this, a screenshot of this to someone else, I can send the dashboard or even one of the tiles themselves and it has all the context you need right there. I'm showing it to you like this as an abstracted version, not just because I get in trouble for showing you all of our numbers, but because at its core, dashboards really are just this simple construction of these components. And so I would encourage you to next time you're starting with a dashboard, think about it within these abstracted versions and how the hierarchy is going to fit together. Here are some of the templates that I've put together. So these tiled layouts, they're great for packing a ton of metrics together into a grid style, a rows and columns style dashboard. Here's an example of what a dashboard might look like with that pattern. You can see all your metrics are on the screen at once, easy to monitor at a glance the health of my business. These long and wide layouts like I showed great for stacking metrics on top of each other. The thing I love about these is that all the components are vertically aligned, and so it's really easy to follow down a dashboard, particularly with the trends. If I want to know the seasonality or if there's patterns or correlations between different metrics, they're now all aligned on the same axis, and I can easily see that. My last tip add padding to your dashboards. I think this is the easiest thing you can do to improve the look and feel of a dashboard. Go home tonight and try this, and I guarantee you it's going to make your dashboards look cleaner. Yeah. All right, we got a padding fan. <laughs> Tableau makes this easy. Right in the interface, they have inner and outer padding options for any object that you have on your dashboard, be it a sheet or a layout container. So this is a screenshot of my most popular dashboard on Tableau Public. It's a superstore sales creation, just simply you know, with some of these KPIs and trends. And you might be looking at this and wondering, you know, this looks OK, but it's a little cluttered, and everything seems crammed together. I don't know why this is his most popular dashboard. The only thing that I've changed is I removed all the padding from this. So watch how big of a difference it makes simply utilizing visual hierarchy and padding within a dashboard. And this is what the real one looks like. And it went from something that was a mess to now something that's really well designed and easy to use. When I'm consulting on you know, dashboard design projects, I think the first thing that I start with and I tell almost everyone is, let's just try adding more padding and letting things breathe. OK, so to recap, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about how to ensure the path to data is short at a large, data-hungry company. At Spotify, we do this with distributing our analytics team. We're enabling analysis-friendly ecosystems with this role of analytics engineers bridging the gap between data science and data engineering. We're surfacing our most important dashboards through insights portals. And we have lots of these resources to keep everyone enabled. And then my favorite dashboarding tips from the theoretical down to the practical. I want to thank everyone that has helped me with this, dash, uh, with this presentation, either the content or uh, having me practice with them. Remind you all that you can evaluate this session. I would really appreciate any feedback that you have. And thank you all for coming. Again, I've got these stickers up here if you want to come chat afterwards.